uh, hello. Uh, to take today, we'll talk about uh, uh, three very important architects. I, I will start with uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Well, he was not an architect, but he had an interest in architecture as well, although he didn't build besides that um, double helix uh, staircase uh, at the Chambord uh, castle in France. But let's read a little bit about this giant uh, of, uh, of uh, European culture and culture in general. How else could we describe Leonardo da Vinci? So Leonardo da Vinci, he was born on this day, 15th of April, but in 1452. So that is, uh, let me see if I can count, 571 years ago. Was an Italian polymath. You know, he was a genius. He was uh, active as a painter, sculptor, architect, draftsman, theorist, engineer, and scientist. My God, my God. While his fame, fame initially rested on his achievements as a painter, he also became known for his notebooks in which he made drawings and notes on variety of subjects, including anatomy, astronomy, botany, bart cartography, painting, and paleontology. Leonardo's genius epitomized the Renaissance hum humanist ideal, and his collective works compose a contribution to later generations of artists, rivaled only by that of his younger contemporary and fellow Florentine, Michelangelo. Uh, born out of a wedlock to a successful notary and a lower class woman, whatever that means. I don't like this language, a lower class woman. He was educated by the renowned Italian painter and sculptor Andrea del Verrocchio. He began his career in Florence and then spent much time in the service of Ludovico Sforza in Milan. In Milan. Later, he worked in Florence and Milan again as well as briefly in Rome, while, while, while attracting a large following of imitators and students. Upon the invitation of François Premier, Francis I, uh, the King of France, uh, a very interesting man, he spent his last three years in France where he died in 1519. So he died in 1519. Since his death, there has not been a time where his achievements diverse interests, personal life, and empirical thinking have failed to incite interest and admiration, making him a frequent namesake and subject in culture. Leonardo is among the greatest painters in the history of art. Uh, unfortunately, there is something here that, broke, uh, that blocks my uh, second uh, line of and exasperates me. That's why I, I, I jump over the second line of the text, but you can read it. Now I can read it. Despite having many lost works and less than 25 attributed major works in painting, including numerous unfinished works, he created some of the most um, influential paintings in Western art. His magnum opus, the Mona Lisa, is his best known work and often regarded as the world's most famous painting. The Last Supper is the most reproduced religious painting of all time, and his Vitruvian Man drawing is also regarded as a cultural icon. In 2017, Salvatore Mundi, attributed in whole or part to Leonardo, was sold at auction for 450 million, setting a new record for most expensive painting ever sold, sold at public auction. Well, this only tells us how poor we are these days if we measure everything in money. But I took this uh, text from uh, Wikipedia. And uh, okay, moving forward. A self-portrait. Uh, he died, I think, at, uh, I don't know, 66, 67. Uh, he looks like an older man here, but at that time people didn't live such long lives, although uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti did live a long life, but uh, most other artists and architects didn't live such long lives, including uh, Leonardo. Now we'll see his, um, you know, hometown and his, uh, you know, house of birth 
Casa Natale, where he was born. Uh, this is it. Well, I imagine, you know, uh, reconsolidated or uh, I don't know, maybe even refurbished. Anyway, it looks good, no? After more than five centuries, made of stone. It's, uh, you know, it's a building which uh, has some dignity, but I'm sure it received some, you know, uh, support from. Uh, you know, uh, the admirers of this great cultural figure. In Tuscany, Anchiano, Casa Natale di Leonardo. Uh, drawings. Uh, he drew incessantly and he drew beautifully. I mean, if he only left drawings behind him, he would have been considered one of the greatest artists ever. But then he also made technical drawings, extremely coherent, logical, but also drawn sensitively. And this is the magic that Leonardo was capable of. Even when he made, when he made countless sketches of, of a scientific character, he still was able to infuse emotion in those drawings. They are not cold-blooded drawings. They are warm blooded drawings they are, they are they are sensitive and and this is not easy to do at all he did it i mean between machineries and angels he found the resources the inner resources to um, you know to to infuse everything with a, with a sense of wonder i i remember um, albert einstein saying that there are only two ways to live one is by saying that nothing is a miracle or feeling that nothing is a miracle. And the other one is by feeling the very opposite, that everything is a miracle. I think for Leonardo da Vinci, everything was a miracle. Absolutely everything. And he had this insatiable curiosity, which I wish so much, at least some of us would have, but it's very hard to come across people who have this immense curiosity, uh, in a way of an eternal child, continuously absorbing and continuously asking questions. Well, I don't know if you know, apparently he was accused of necrophilia. You know, he used to investigate corpses and, uh, you know, uh, maybe his curiosity was also uh, at times, at least, um, colored, so to speak, by uh, an excessive affection, excessive affection for um, the aforementioned corpses. Anyway, who knows what the truth was? But apparently, he even went to court for this. He was, he was, he, he was uh, a unique man, you know, and, and and his drawings show it, and not just his drawings. He invented, well, invented, he practiced a form of painting, uh, you know, called sfumato, where he would uh, um, uh, estompate, he would uh, uh, dilute, he would uh, weaken the contour line, you know, like you see here, it's, it's the, the figure emerges from the background, but without being separated from the background by a contour line. Uh, his pages of studies are uh, unbelievable. I mean, you know, again, because they are analytical, they are descriptive, but they are also sensitive. They are beautiful. That's why a page from his countless pages of studies could be considered artworks, although they were just his studies, his uh, sketches uh, of a certain uh, object or subject that interest, interested him. Anatomical drawings. So again, it's not just that he drew what he drew, but also how he drew it. You know, he drew it with a great mastery and great sensitivity. I love his drawings, and not only his drawings. Da Vinci, a life in drawing. What a man. Of course, he's admired. But, but, in essence, he was the amateur par excellence. Yes, he was an amateur. He 
all his life he spent, uh, you know, investigating, but not with uh, lucrative uh, ends in his mind, you know. But here I have to say that the word amateur lost its positive meaning. Initially, in Latin, the word amateur derived from the word amare, which means to, li to love. So to be an amateur means to love something. You love something. But that meaning was lost. And for us today, we oppose to the amateur, the professional, the cold-blooded professional, who is a mercenary, who is paid to do a job and maybe does it uh, correctly. But I don't think, you know, uh, uh, correctness is everything. You know, maybe the professional is uh, quick, is efficient, does the job well, but doesn't do it out of love of doing that work. Uh, he or she does it because she or she, she or he or he or she is paid. This is not the case of the amateur. The amateur loves to do something and out of that love do, does what uh, he or she does. And I'm so glad that uh, Wang Shu, the, the very important Chinese uh, architect, called his office, is a contemporary with us, in China, of course, uh, amateur architecture. Well, he has a doctorate in architecture, but he called his office, office amateur architecture. Maybe with a thought of uh, bringing back the original meaning of the word amateur. So why am I saying that Leonardo was in essence a, 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 an amateur of genius? Because, you know, he did these studies, nobody asked him to do them. They were, they were, all, of them, all of them were the result of his curiosity, immense curiosity. And he explored them, and most of them actually were sketches, you know, sketches in architecture as well. And we are going to see some of his projects. They all remained as sketches. But, but these sketches are immensely beautiful and also immensely instructive. Because like here, you know, you see how the things are constituted, how they come together. And, uh, you know, I mean, even in technical terms, in mechanical terms, he was immensely accurate, but the drawings are also very, very beautiful. If I would have this drawing, you know, I would immediately put it on the wall, on the glass, because it is beautiful, like this one as well. And these are anatomical drawings. Or look here, we see the you know, the, the tempest in water, the turmoil of, uh, 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 of water. I mean, in itself is, uh, is magical. Even, you know, I mean, who would attempt to draw something like this? He also drew the, the hair of, of women, you know, in the same way, very, very accurately and very, very sensitively at the same time. I don't know very well about the meaning of the word genius, but if we are to accept this word, we do have to accept that Leonardo had genius, yes. He understood, because you cannot draw like this if you don't understand what you are drawing. He understood or had the intuition of. So, he literally united the two sides of the brain, so to speak. He, he was able to marry, you know, the analytical with the emotional. And uh, that's why his drawings are so accurate and on the other hand, so sensitive. Look here, you know, studies of flowers. It looks like Leonardo da Vinci comprehended the mystery of nature. If I'm not idealizing him, but then how could you idealize someone of, of his stature in culture. I think his main force, his main attribute, him, his main quality, besides his extreme ability to draw, was his unbelievable curiosity. Because again, what made him investigate so many fields, you know? And I mean, look at this drawing, it's, it's, it's masterful.
Did he die? No, he didn't die, of course. He's much more alive than most of us. Now, through his works. He could have done anything. He would have been superlative in anything he would have done. I don't think there was something that he could not have done. I, I with this with this statement, I probably, um, you know, uh, idealize him. But or maybe he couldn't do a certain sport. Maybe, but uh, you know, a man who was able to 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 keep up his curiosity so diverse and for, for the length of his life, and who was able to, to externalize uh, the fruits of this curiosity the way he did. Look at the smile on this face. It's, it's sublime, it's magical. You can only be speechless when you look at this beauty, the expression of this face, of this head. Architecture. Now we're, we are going to see some things that he did in architecture. He didn't build, except that apparently it's attributed to him the double helix uh, staircase uh, or stair at the, the Chambord uh, castle in France. But we are going to see the Vitruvian man. So the, Vitruvi the Vitruvian man, originally known as Le Proporzioni del Corpo Humano Secondo, Vitruvio, the proportions of the human body, according to Vitruvius, is a drawing made by the Italian polymath Leonardo da Vinci in about 1490, so 533 years ago. It is accompanied by notes based on the work of the Roman architect Vitruvius. The drawing, which is in ink on paper, depicts a man in two superimposed positions with his arms and legs apart and inscribed in a circle and square. We all know it. There are even, uh, you know, contemporary alternatives where instead of a man there, a woman is placed. And I think uh, a very valid uh, alternative because why, why should there be again and again his majesty man? Why not a woman? Why not both? Why just a man? The drawing represents da, da Vinci's concept of the ideal human body proportions. Its inscription in a square and a circle comes from a description by the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius in book, book three of his treatise De Architectura. Yet, as it has been demonstrated, Leonardo did not represent Vitruvius proportions of the limbs, but rather included those he found himself after measuring male models in Milan. While the drawing is named after Vitruvius, some scholars today question the appropriateness of such a title, given that it was first used in the 1940s. A good point, perhaps. This image demonstrates the blend of mathematics and art during the Renaissance and demonstrates Leonardo's deep understanding of proportion. In addition, this picture represents a cornerstone of Leonardo's attempts to relate man to nature. Encyclopedia Britannica online states, I quote, Leonardo envisaged, en en envisaged the great picture chart of the human body he had produced through his anatomical drawings and Vitruvian man is a cosmography, cosmography or cosmographia del minor minor mondo, cosmography of the microcosm. He believed the workings of the human body.
to be an analogy for the workings of the universe. I, I, I think he was correct. So Vitruvian man illustration in the edition of the Architectura by Vitruvius. This is what, uh, you know, uh, the illustration in 1521 by Cesare Cesariano of the Vitruvian man, very different the illustration from what uh, uh, Leonardo did. But this one interesting too, in its own way. At the first, uh, at the first sight. Sketch of Milan Cathedral by Leonardo da Vinci. He sketched incessantly all kinds of architecture. Well, maybe not so many all kinds, you know, mostly churches. And by the way, he loved the octagon. He worked almost uh, exclusively with octagons. Uh, we are going to see, I mean, for example, the building here at the bottom is octagon, octagonal in, in plan. And I hope to have um, a picture of the plan. He drew machineries, construction machineries. Uh, again, the Vitruvian man. What about the Vitruvian woman? Here you see the octagon. And I read that, yes, uh, he, he loved the octagon. Most of his uh, sketches for architecture use octagonal, uh, octagonal plans or the octagon is used in one way or another. And then uh, he also has, uh, you know, these kind of sketches where, <laughs> you know, he, he actually didn't have to build because he thought of everything, you know. Uh, and so this is kind of interesting, you know, in an age uh, affected by all kinds of crises like ours with the climate change and so on, maybe we could return to the uh, to the, um, you know, uh, Leonardian model, you know, we can draw, we can imagine, and in a way, some people do it through metaverse, you know, we, we imagine uh, buildings and uh, urban contexts and so on, without actually building them. Well, in a way, that's what Leonardo did too, you know, he, I mean, this was not based on a scene, uh, scene, on a scene, you know, construction process, but on an imagined one, which never happened. And here is again, uh, you know, the, the octagon. And the symbolism of the octagon on the YouTube, YouTube channel that uh, where I, I post um, um, these presentations, I have a presentation about number eight, where you know, of course, I talk a lot about the octagon, but about the symbolism of number eight, because the octagon, of course, has eight sides. So when I said that he was the amateur par excellence, I don't think I was too far away from truth. I mean, this was not built. He, he would just draw, he would draw incessantly. And, and I wish some of these things were built because because uh, it would have been great, but they were not built. Now, I don't know about this man here. What is he doing uh, by the way of architecture? Probably nothing. Uh, I don't know why I, I show him, him here. Again, back to, to some architectural uh, uh, sketches. I still, I, I do not comprehend. I refuse to comprehend why an in insensitive librarian or bureaucrats placed a stamp on a drawing by Leonardo. Uh, it's just, I don't comprehend it. You know, without any respect. I mean, how could you do this? You can do it on the back of the of the page, no? For if you really have to do it. But to do it on, on the front of the drawing, it, it's unbelievable. Anyway. <laughs> Beautiful drawings, truly beautiful drawings. What else can I say? And he didn't pollute the world. Well, he did use a little bit of paper, it's true. But the pollution that came from the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci is very, 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 very small compared to what we do with our concrete towers and buildings and 
highways and infrastructure and parking lots and garages and so on. And this, I imagine, works. You know, it's, it's not just a beautiful drawing. I don't know its function, but I read that actually many of these drawings are of functional devices. They did function or could have functioned if they were built. No, this man, uh, uh, you know, uh, discovered the, you know, the cornerstone of life, uh, lapis, as the alchemists might call it. it it's, And not a single drawing is bad. They are all good, artistically good, not just descript descriptively. I guess he knew some perspective. Maybe he knew perspective. Brunelleschi, who invented the perspective, and Piero della Francesca, well, they lived before Leonardo, so. He didn't invent the perspective, but if it was not invented already, he could have invented it, no doubt. Now, I don't know what to think about this Vitruvian man, you know. Again, why is it just a man? Why not a woman? It's like manhood is just about man, as if the human being is just man, and it's not so. Plus, I don't think at our time, is uh, is uh, is is uh, advisable to celebrate uh, anthropos because we ruin nature we ruin the climate let's not forget we didn't have a winter in bucharest this year and we didn't have one last year and we didn't have one before that so it might be because of him the vitruvian man all very centered and all very self-centered and all very proud of himself and it's not Leonardo's, uh, you know, uh, scene that, you know, we have the climate uh, problems. I'm not referring to him. I would never call Leonardo uh, an anthropos. No, although he was maybe with the highest quality. Machineries. Now the grand staircase at Chateau de Chambord from 1519 and it is attributed to him. Francois Premier, the great king of France, invited him because he valued very much intellect. And not too many, not too many kings do that, but uh, Francois Premier did so, invited him to uh, France, and he was in residence, residency, I guess, even uh, at the Chateau de Chambord. I'm not sure about this, but apparently he designed this famous staircase. Here is just one, um, one helix, but there is another one around this one, so it's a double helix. Um, then it might have been by him, because I see the spiral. Now, of course, uh, the spiral, he was not the only one to use the spiral, but he was fascinated by process, by becoming, and spiral, the spiral is uh, uh, conducive for... Uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, architectonic, and uh, not only architectonic uh, um, imaginings. So you see the model on the right. And uh, anyway, it's a spiral staircase. Actually, I am a little bit confused because I, only from the outside, I see that there are two, uh, two helixes. This drawing belongs to Andrea Palladio for the same kind of, you know, double helix uh, staircase. A very interesting one, this one, and the drawing also beautiful in the case of uh, Andrea Palladio. It's from his four books on architecture. And these people drew magnificently and they didn't need renderings in a commercial sense as we so often uh, do. No. Uh, Leonardo, uh, uh, Andrea Palladio didn't even use perspective. I never saw a perspective of drawing of, Leonardo, of uh, Andrea Palladio. And uh, perspective was invented at least one, around 150 years before uh, Palladio's time. So why didn't he use perspective? 
So this is seen from the outside, this double helix uh, staircase at Chambord, which is attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Now, I don't know if he also did uh, the ceiling and the whatever is on the left and the right. But, you know, we can assume that there is some truth in this, that this staircase was designed by him while he was uh, working, so to speak, or invited, uh, you know, by King uh, Francois Premier. So this is the void, you know, uh, at the center of the of the double helix staircase. This drawing belongs to him, but this is um, it is a double stair, but we cannot really call it, uh, you know, helix or helicoidal. Another sketch, an architectonic sketch that he did. I so wish he would have designed some buildings and built them because it would have been very interesting to see something built by him. But as I said, he was, he was happy to imagine possible worlds without actually you know, bringing them to the ultimate fruition. If I am to call building a building the ultimate fruition. But the, the beauty of the drawing in itself is a, an achievement of the highest order. As a younger man here, Leonardo. Now, Leonardo, the architect, apparently he designed this bridge, uh, which was built in Istanbul later, or the one, the modern one that was built was based on, uh, on some sketch, uh, sketch, uh, sketches that uh, he did for this Sultan Bayezid the second of Constantinople, Istanbul. So Leonardo did what you see on the left, but it was built, you know, rather recently, uh, you know, uh, derived from his sketches. So in this sense, you could say that uh, over the years, of the, over the few, some centuries, something that he imagined and, you know, let's say to an extent designed, was uh, was was built in Istanbul. Leonardo the architect. So you see, it's not just the drawing, but it's also the quotation, the writing. And apparently, he wrote in the mirror, you know, from because you can see it's it's written from from right to left. It's written in the in the mirror. I I don't even know how he wrote it. Like how how he was able to write like this. And why did he do it this way? I think I read somewhere that he made many grammar mistakes in his uh, writing. It doesn't matter, you know. I mean, his thinking was brilliant, and he. I guess he wrote mainly for himself. He, again, the octagon here on the left. Octagons, octagons fascinated him. Now, some paintings by this great painter, among other things. Leonardo. Beautiful painting, isn't it? Now, this man is gone, Leonardo is gone, although he didn't die. I don't know if, if, if my, my words uh, could add anything here, really. Maybe I should just let the images speak by themselves because they are very eloquent and very beautiful. Apparently, he didn't use, like in, uh, in frescoes, he didn't use the correct, uh, you know, uh, he experimented. He, uh, that's why the Last Supper, uh, 
barely survived and uh, very affected by the passage of time because he experimented with pigments, with, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, technicalities uh, without uh, respecting the, you know, the, the dogma, so to speak, the dogma, the, the way to do things, the classical way to do things. He always experimented and <laughs> he paid the price or we pay the price, everybody paid the price. But the few remaining works by him are, are sublime. This is the Last Supper, where was refurbished and because uh, if it would have been left uh, uh, prey to the elements, uh, we would have no Last Supper by Leonardo any longer. And of course the famous um, Mona Lisa, which keeps adding countless people in front of it, uh, you know, wandering, wandering. And then we had the modern artists who played with this uh, inviolable work of art, you know, placing a mustache under her nose or, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, envious little gestures, even of some very important contemporary or modern artists. Leonardo da Vinci, his paintings, a search for perfection. The man on the left, the painting on the right. And you know, I am thinking, you know, why can't we, instead of running on the highway on our magical cars, medley to nowhere, essentially, why can't we dedicate our lives to perfecting ourselves in our little room? Uh, we don't need a big room to do that. You know, you need a chair. Perhaps you need a table, perhaps you need some paper and some pencils, or you can do work digitally now and just work for perfection, work for our development, your, your development, to become a better, a better human being at whatever you do, and to explore, to investigate, to invent. Like Pascal said, you know, all the problems of human human life are because the human cannot stand still in a room. Because if we can stand still in a room, we can work on ourselves, as opposed to cutting down trees and building, uh, I don't know, the tallest buildings in the world or going to Mars. Why can't we just stay in a room and draw, think, dream, maybe listen to some music, produce some beautiful drawings? Why not? And we would not affect the climate, would you? Would we? Why was he fascinated also by angels? We don't believe in angels any longer, of course. Who would believe in angels? Only a madman. Certainly not an architect. The architect is very, you know, lucid, very rational, very objective. Why? Well, what does architecture have to do with angels? But Leonardo loved the angels. This is not uh, really his work. So this was it. I ended rather abruptly. Actually, I didn't expect to, to end so abruptly. Uh, let's, uh, let's uh, for a short while, um, have a short talk, if you don't mind.